so many athletes out there, endurance athletes, triathlon, cycling, running, whatever sport you're in, the holy grail is to improve VO2 max. So what we're gonna break down today is exactly how you can train to improve VO2 max, but then also the common mistakes that a lot of athletes and coaches are making when they're planning and preparing sessions and actually completing sessions that is completely giving us the wrong stimulus and not allowing you to maximize your time at or close to VO2 max and therefore improve the, the ultimate number you're looking for and actually get the adaptation you want. So this video is gonna break it down really simple, just straight down the line of how you can improve VO2 max, the easiest, most basic scientific way you can do it. Um, yeah, let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who has checked out some of the videos so far and already hit the subscribe button. But if you haven't or you're new to the channel, first of all, if you are new, welcome to the channel. Hope you enjoy some of the videos up here. But if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button down below. Uh, really is great to see plenty of people following along and, and trying to learn something about the science of endurance in particular uh, and get a bit of better understanding of uh, sports science and how it applies not just the elite or professional athletes but all the way down to to anyone who's taking their racing or training reasonably seriously or or wanting to push themselves a bit further it's sports science as a whole uh, that, that governs the principles that that allow us to improve human performance so thanks Ray, for some of the feedback and, and the, the support really appreciate it we're going to get stuck into today's video which is all about training to improve VO2 max. Now, if you haven't already, go check out and I'll link it above the video that I did on what is VO2 max and the breakdown of, of understanding that. But if you have already watched it or you have a bit of an idea, you'd know that VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen we can take in, transport and utilize in one minute. So basically it's the effectiveness of the aerobic energy system to use oxygen to break down fuel and create energy, which is perfect for the endurance athlete so we want the biggest aerobic engine as possible. And that's why we see our elite athletes up with a, a really high relative VO2 max of, of 80, 85, 90, and maybe even sort of 95 and above in some cases we've seen before. The key thing though, and the, the kicker I guess, is how do we actually train to improve VO2 max? Because there's a lot of different training methods that athletes use, but when we're looking at it from a, from a scientific perspective, there's very few things that we actually need to do to get a very, very quick and um, very key stimulus to be able to improve that VO2 max overall. I'm gonna start with more beginner and intermediate athletes. So if you're just getting into, into some endurance racing and training, really one of the first things you need to do is just do any training in general. So a lot of that is come, coming from doing just some continuous training, getting out there and, and actually going for a run. If you haven't run before, working yourself up to be able to run for half an hour, 45, 60 minutes, however long you need to. Continuous training up to a, when athletes get to a relative VO2 max of about 60 mils per kilo per minute. So if you're watching that on your, your Garmin, your Apple Watch, or you're tracking it through there, you're going and doing lab testing, whatever it may be. Once you get up to about 60 mils uh, per kilo per minute as your relative VO2 max, continuous training by itself is not enough to then provide a continuous improvement. In some athletes, you might get a little bit of variance and, and 60 is gonna be a, a general rule just by doing continuous types types of training. So that might be going out and doing a long, slow endurance type run, might be doing more of a solid endurance or a tempo. Um, you might even go out and do sort of a 45 minute threshold, just single effort. Continuous training as a whole, uh, where you just go out and do the one pace and just basically sit on that and do it for a long period of time and, and your focus is on duration or the volume, is only good until we get to a relative error to a 60 which for a lot of people is gonna be quite a high benchmark. I mean, not everyone's gonna get up there, genetics plays a bit of a role, but it's the type of thing that it's very limiting for those more intermediate and advanced and ultimately elite athletes whose VO2 maxes are probably already at 60, and now you're trying to get it to a higher level even more so, which is gonna allow you to run faster or ride faster, be a lot better in terms of competition and competing, the aerobic endurance is there, but we've got this top end of the engine now that's firing for us on, on all cylinders as well. So how do we now get that improvement past 60 if we can't just do continuous on your own? You still need to keep it in, I'm gonna highlight that. You still need to keep the continuous training in because it's important for our aerobic capacity and our volume, keeping the Ks into the legs, etc. But we now need to supplement it with something more high intensity and, and where we're starting to split it now is the two parts of our VO2 max engine. We have the aerobic system that it works from an aerobic capacity perspective, and that's just Ks into legs, your long your long distance duration, being able to complete distances or complete certain volumes, time limits, etc. Our aerobic power is the rate at which we can use oxygen. Now we need to get a better stimulus of how quickly we can use oxygen. That's gonna help us at the top end of our engine. So when we do a when we do a test, for example, we do a VO2 max test, it's a, it's a step test on a treadmill, starts out really slow, each stage gets progressively faster and faster and faster, or you can do the same on a bike with wattage, etc. 
what we're essentially then finding at VO2 Max is that the highest speed and pace that you can continuously take in transport and utilize oxygen at a, at a maximal level before we get no more incre increase in that oxygen consumption. Let's say that pace is four minute Ks for a, for a runner. Maybe it's 300 watts for a cyclist or, or either of those could be for a triathlete as well. It's all very well to have that as your max, but everything then works a percentage of your max. So where I'm getting to at with this is if you're maxing out at 300 watts, you're maxing out four minute Ks, if your VO2 max doesn't improve and we can't lift that velocity at VO2 max or the pace or the wattage at VO2 max, the actual intensity you're outputting, everything as a percentage can only move so far. And this is where a lot of athletes fall into the trap of, I do lots of, lots of continuous training. They've just focused on the aerobic capacity side of things and they're not necessarily working on the aerobic power. Maybe they're doing some threshold in between and threshold is a little bit different in that it's not necessarily the engine, it's the cylinders in that engine. It's how functional that engine is. The percentages of that 100 you can yeah, can hold. Out of my four minute K pace, which is my absolute top end, can't go any faster, um, that's my VO2 max, you can only hold about 90, 95% of it before you can't really improve your threshold anymore. Threshold only can really get up to 90, 95% of your VO2 max. So now it's a case of, well, how do we extend that top end and this is where high intensity interval training or HIIT type training comes in, is a really effective method of improving our aerobic power at the top end, improve the, the speed or power or pace, whatever we're putting out. It gives that performance boost, extend the top end of the engine, and before you know it, now we've got a bigger VO2 max as well. How do we actually perform a high intensity interval training session and how do we do it effectively? Basically, any HIIT session is, is some sort of really high, almost maximal intensity, usually, type training where we're going as hard as we can in an effort and then we're having a recovery period and we're repeating that over and over so interval training I, I assume for most of you watching isn't a new concept we, we see it all the time we hear about interval training all the time how do we make it effective for an improvement in vo2 max though the key to it is maximizing the time spent at or near our velocity of vo2 max if we're talking about running or our power at vo2 max this is important because the more time we can spend up at and at near or even above VO2 max, the better of a stimulus we get in terms of improving our ability to use oxygen at the muscle. So more a greater size number and surface area of mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell that take the oxygen, convert it into a uh, break down the fuel using oxygen and convert that into energy. That's what's actually gonna give us the power that we need to be able to do what we're doing, our endurance sport. Um, but it's that time accumulated that's critical. So there's a number of different ways we can maximize our time up there. You could just go out and do one single effort for six minutes, seven minutes, which would be like doing a 2K time trial, bang on, and then and then that would be it. But that's a really ineffective way because we're only really accumulating, say, two minutes, or, or only accumulating six minutes, should I say, at velocity of VO2 max, just below, just above. What we could also do is break that down into multiple intervals. So we could go at the longer end of the spectrum. When I say long interval, for a lot of you, this isn't gonna sound long, but when I start talking some of the other things we can do, you're gonna realize why it's long. We can do intervals of anywhere between two to four minutes in length. These are really, really effective. If we work at what we call 95% of our VO2 max, or 95% of our velocity at VO2 max, 95% of our power at VO2 max. So we're just taking the edge off a little bit in terms of pace, but we're holding that for two to four minutes in length. We then give ourselves an equal recovery. So if you're doing this running, if you're um, 345 paces your VO2 max intensity, about 355 is 95%, close enough to without doing the maths correct, uh, completely correctly. You're gonna hold 355 pace for two minutes and then you get a two minute walking recovery. 355 pace for two minutes again, walking recovery. Repeating that to accumulate 12 to 20 minutes of working time is gonna give you ideal stimulus in terms of time spent at VO2 max. Why is that the case? It's because we start we start our first effort, we come up, 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 and up, and up. We get to VO2 max intensity um, after a sort of 30 seconds, 45 seconds within that interval. We have a time, a lag time when we come up. When we get there, the rest of the interval sit on it. We come back down. By having the complete full recovery, one-to-one -one work to rest ratio, two minutes on, two minutes off, what does that give us? It gives us the ability to hit that intensity again, and again, and again, and again. So over the course of a session, the, we can accumulate five efforts, six efforts, seven efforts, eight efforts of two minutes. If you're doing three minute intervals, you can do four, five, six, seven efforts. We can accumulate over the course of the session, 15, 18 minutes of working time compared to if you just did a 2K time trial, there's only six and a half, seven minutes maybe for most people. You're getting a lot more out of it. You do need to progress that. You can't just jump straight up and do um, it necessarily nine by two minute efforts or you can't just jump up and do six by three minute efforts. You need to work your way up. 
But there is a, that's a very simple way of getting really quality time at VO, velocity of VO2 max or just below VO2 max. Why we go just below is because we get pretty close to it, but because we've got a longer interval, we're just balancing our loading. So our volume goes up because we've got more time in a single effort. So our intensity has to come down to then counterbalance that. Another way we can go, and this is probably arguably in the research and the literature, the most effective way to spend time at VO2 max. And when we do this, when they've done studies previously where it shows time to um, drop off, so how many efforts did it take until we couldn't hit that intensity anymore, you can see in something like a 30 second effort, you can see that's almost the ideal amount of time where athletes can just keep going and going and going and going and going as long as they have that equal 30 second recovery. So again, one to one work to rest ratio. 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Instead of going just below VO2 max though, because we've got a shorter effort, it now flips. We now need to turn the intensity up. So we head closer to about 105, 110% of VO2 max. What does that mean? If you're maxing out, say 345 paces, your VO2 max pace. When we're doing two to four minute efforts, I said we go down to 95, so it's like 355. Now for a 30 second effort, we're coming up close to sort of 335, 330, somewhere in that period. We're going a lot faster because we're only sustaining it for a short period of time. We need to get our responses up, our oxygen consumption up as quickly as possible by getting the pace up there really quick. In a session like this, you're gonna be able to do a lot more inter intervals because they're shorter, but we're accumulating similar amounts of time. So you might do something like um, 10 by 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, have a two to three minute walk and recovery and then 10 by 30 on, 30 off again. That's a really solid session. You can do efforts like that 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off, you just turn the pace up even more. A lot of these sessions, a lot of athletes aren't, aren't really sort of focusing on. And I guess this is where the key mistakes come in, in terms of sessions that I see. And, and it really sparks to mind, I had a question come through on a YouTube video not too long ago, where uh, someone was asking about, I, I see a lot of people do 40, 20, um, 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, is that beneficial uh, in terms of improving VO2 max? And I'm gonna argue that that session is nowhere near as beneficial because what we've got is a two to one work to rest ratio versus a one to one. This is where the research kicks in, where the sports science comes into it as to why a one to one work to rest ratio is far superior than a two to one or any other type, to, type of work to rest ratio um, when it comes to improving VO2 max because we come back to the whole process that I said at the start of we need to accumulate as much time and time spent at or near VO2 max is the key to getting improvement and the stimulus of the adaptations that we need. As soon as we start to drop off through fatigue, as soon as we can't maintain that intensity up at near VO2 max anymore, we're not now spending any time up there. So now we're not providing that same stimulus we need to adapt and improve. Doing a one-to-one -one work to ratio, 30 seconds on, I come up to here, 30 seconds off, I go down. 30 seconds on, I'm back up again, same point. I repeat that. I can constantly hit every interval at that same intensity so I get maximum time at VO2 max. Yep, I might get 20 efforts in the session of 30 seconds. There's, what, five, five minutes in each block. We're talking 10 minutes of total working time at VO2 max. If I do 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, now I've got a two-to-one work to rest. So I'm on for... I'm on for a period of time and then I'm off for a short period and then I have to go back on again. So your first two, three, four intervals might be okay. Your fifth one starts to decline a bit. Your sixth one declines a little bit. Your seventh declines, eight, nine, 10. You have a rest period. Your first couple are good again and then they start to decline. Now what we've got is we don't have all of our efforts up here. We have kind of this sloping down progression where we couldn't sustain the intensity because short recoveries are gonna cause us to fatigue more. Makes sense. You give yourself more recovery, it's a lot easier to back up an interval than it is if you have a short recovery. What we're now missing out on is that golden time at VO2 max and therefore we're not getting that same stimulus. So that is probably the most common mistake is athletes selling themselves short in recovery. Maintaining your quality of effort is more important than just trying to make yourself hurt in this circumstance. A good time to make yourself hurt is go and do your threshold stuff. Go and do your traditional 1K repeats. Go and do on the bike, eight minutes on, four minutes off. That's gonna make you really race race tuned, um, help from an FTP or threshold perspective. And if you just want a hard session, that's the one to go for. These VO2 sessions are still gonna be hard, but we need the quality to be able to get the adaptation and stimulus. I see it time and time again when athletes don't necessarily pay attention to this and they do a lab test, um, a VO2 max test, we hook them up to the mask, we actually measure their oxygen consumption. VO2 max is 60, 65, whatever it may be. The first time they come in, they come back and nothing has changed. They're exactly the same. Why? Because they didn't follow the process and didn't maintain time at VO2 max. 
athletes who do come in, their VO2 max might be 60, 65. They come in three months time, they followed the process, they've maintained time at VO2 max, given themselves the adequate recovery. It may not be the most fun doing a three minute walk after a three minute effort, you might feel you're really, really cruising through the session. But as long as that effort is, is quality each single time, you are getting the right stimulus. They come back in, we see VO2 is up five mils per kilo, 10 mils per kilo. I've had athletes come in at lower VO2s at some of those ones I said before, we can improve up to that so 60 mils per kilo per minute just by doing continuous training. I've seen athletes at the low end, 45 VO2s, 50 VO2, even a 55 VO2, come back in three months later, do some continuous mixed in with this high intensity interval training and tune that high intensity interval training very specifically to them with pacing, making sure that one to one weight ratio, rest ratio, etc. They come back in, the VO2 max is up by 10 or even 15 mils per kilo per minute in the space of a couple of months. That is enough of a difference if we're then talking performance, and I'm gonna leave you with this, that's enough of a difference to take someone from a 25 minute 5K easily to a 20 minute or sub 20 minute 5K running. It's easily gonna take a time a time trial time down. It's gonna lift everything up in terms of your, your overall performance. FTP is gonna come up as a result. Boost the engine, you can fill the cylinders in later. So I know that's a lot of information to take in, but I really had to go through the key points of why a lot of athletes are just getting it completely wrong with two to one weeks rest ratios and things like that and, and just not getting the same stimulus or enough of a quality stimulus to improve from a VO2 max perspective because I know it's really, really frustrating. It's frustrating to look at your watch and go, I'm not getting any better. It says it's the same, it says it's the same. I did a lab test. I did another one a couple of months later. It's all the same. Nothing's changing. Why, why, why? Follow these principles one-to-one work to rest ratio, give yourself plenty of recovery. It's all about time accumulated at or near VO2 max. So I can't stress enough the importance of doing some sort of test to know where your VO2 max is. And I might do another video on, on different tests that we can assess for VO2 max, but it's important to get those numbers and understand what that pacing and intensity needs to be and what it needs to be. And don't, don't sell yourself short and go, this is too easy, I can, I can do it. Make sure quality over the quantity of the session is, is always the key. I'm gonna leave it there because I know I've talked a lot and that's a lot to go through. If you do have any questions, please leave them below in the comments. What are you doing at the moment in terms of your VO2 max sessions? I'm gonna leave it down. Let me know the types of sessions you're doing and we can work through how do we how we can tweak them in the comments and it'd be interesting to see some different methods and different sessions athletes are doing. Hope you've enjoyed today's video. That's it for today and we'll see you in the next one.